Well, uh, hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm beyond happy to see so many faces that I miss and love from around the country and the world. So thank you all so much for being here. And a special thank you and giant virtual hug to our friends who are joining from the West Coast where they're contending with fire and smoke and also from down south where uh, Hurricane Sally has uh, torn in and created some hiccups for people. So thank you again all for uh, managing to be with us today despite the challenges. Um, I'm Bethany Burke with Proud Family Selections and we are the exclusive importer of the incredible wines that we'll be tasting today. Um, each of our panelists represents the next generation of her family-owned winery, and we are so excited to dig in over the next hour or so with some great conversation, tasting, of course, and maybe, just maybe, some musical entertainment. We'll see. Um, I've personally had the pleasure of working with multiple generations from each of these estates over my past 18 years with Cow Family uh, Selections, uh, which is also a fourth-generation family-owned company, by the way. And I can say the future is absolutely bright for each of these estates. We'll hear from Alan Trimbach from Alsace, Alessia Colotta from Gatinara in Piedmonte, and Laura Colombo from the Northern Rhone Valley. But first, I'd like to introduce our esteemed moderator. Dr. Laura Catena is a fourth generation Argentine vineyard. I know most of you uh, know and love her well, and probably know her as, for, as managing director of her family winery, Bodegas uh, Cajeras of Papa and quite possibly as the most dynamic uh, base of Argentine wine that we have uh, in the world today. However, uh, we at Cal Family Selections work with her in her capacity as proprietor of Bodegas Caro. Lara, please tell us a bit about the Caro project before you introduce our panelists. Um, thank you very much, Bethany. First, I want to say that it's so exciting to be chosen as the elder stateswoman moderator because I am older than these beautiful energetic young women and I can tell you what's even more uh, sort of heartwarming is that when I was being introduced when I was younger it, I was always introduced by men and it, it's so wonderful to to have that role to be able to introduce as, as maybe a little the little older uh, I don't want to talk about my age, but the, the older woman, uh, these beautiful young generations in wine. Uh, but in terms of the Caro story, which is such a beautiful story, um, I am actually sitting here with the background of the Cava uh, from the winery. Um, you know, when we were changing the history of Argentine wine, starting exports of high quality Argentine wine throughout the world, we met uh, the, the Rothschild family, family, the Baron Eric de Rothschild. And uh, they had no interest in doing a project in Argentina because it was this unstable economically and politically uh, crazy country in South America. But my father tempted them to come and taste the wines. And they fell in love actually with our Cabernet Sauvignon and then the Malbec, which had been such an important grape in Bordeaux and was you know, no longer planted there. And they fell in love with, with Argentina and they decided actually after being very reluctant to, to form this partnership. And what I always like to thank them for is that, you know, Chateau Lafitte, possibly the most famous wine in the world. Uh, you would have thought they might be a little snobby or, uh, you know, talk down to us. And from the beginning, it's been a 50-50 partnership. When I go to Bordeaux, I stay at the Chateau. Um, the name Catena Rochal Caro is the two names equally. In fact, my father shot it, thought the name should be Roca, but it was already trademarked. And the Baron Eric said, no, no, I like Caro. And so um, this is a beautiful wine, Malbec Cabernet Sauvignon, and you will be tasting it. But, but most of all, it's a beautiful story of uh, two families uh, coming together. So, uh, Bethany, are, are we ready for me to introduce the stars of the day? Let's do it. Yes. Okay. So, um, I'm going to ask some questions to our, our, our great uh, family winemakers here. Um, and uh, ladies, you just go ahead and, and answer as you like. Uh, so, Laure, Laure and I met in Bordeaux once. We were both having a party at the same restaurant and we had so much fun with Laure and her father. And the, the parties ended up mixing in because they are such a dynamic family. 
And uh, what I'm really curious about, Love, is her background. Before she started working for the family, she actually interned or worked in India, in Walt Disney, all around France, all over the world. So I'd love to know, you know, what was her inspiration for having such a diverse experience before working with the family? And, and second, I'd like her to tell us about her life working in one project with her father and in another with her husband. Uh, I work with my father and that is fantastic, but I could never, ever work with my husband. So I want to know Laure's secrets. And I think we don't hear you, Laure. Put the volume on. Yeah. That's good? Sorry. Yes, yes. Merci, Laura. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, organizing all this, Bethany. Uh, so, uh, Laura, you, you were um, wondering a bit why I traveled the world before to go back, but I think you never visited Cornas, which is a small village in the middle of nowhere in France. So when you are a teenager, your, your uh, goal is just to escape this village, <laughs> to flew away the farest you can. <laughs> uh, and that's why I... Uh, I didn't really plan to work in the wine at all. I just wanted to live in big city, attractive city in New York. In, uh, so that's why I worked, actually I worked with Palm Bay for an internship in summer. I worked in India because uh, I love this country. And uh, so I was uh, more into uh, marketing. Uh, I worked for Moët et Chandon for one year to learn. I moved to Bo to work one year also for that's really where I learned oops, oops, sorry, I have a you can hear me? I think there were two problems. Oh it's good. Sorry. And uh, and finally, uh, I think that by traveling around the world, what I really learned is that uh, I, I learned about my roots and that's why I wanted to come back because then I realized what my terroir of Cornas was meaning and, uh, and that finally uh, making wine in India or in Champagne was not really um, what I had in my blood. So that's why I came back. Uh, but it was not so easy to come back, like you said, uh, to take over, to work with uh, your family is not always easy. Actually, uh, I don't like to say I, take, I took over because it's not true. I didn't take over. I joined the, the family, um, the family uh, adventure. Uh, but uh, I joined in 2010 and little by little, uh, I learned to work with my dad, with my mom. Uh, and in 2018, so basically uh, eight years after having joined my, uh, my parents' adventure, uh, there is a big um, uh, accident. Oh, well, Paul Bocuse, who is a famous chef in France, and he's like my dad's godfather, uh, died in 2018. Uh, my dad was 62. And uh, he directly told me that uh, it, was, it was his goal in life to be like Paul Bocuse. And I realized that I was 34, so he was 62. So this brings us to uh, 30 years later because Paul Bocuse dies at 92. So this means I would probably be able to decide what I wanted to do in this cellar when I would be 62 which was a bit uh, a long time for me. So I said, okay, so I think the best thing is to create my own little things on my side, to keep working, join with my parents, but to have my own little uh, uh, playground, exactly. So that's what I did in 2014, in the meantime, uh, with my husband. So like you said, working with husband uh, is another the other adventure. But uh, the little things that helped me is that my husband, Dimitri, is a photographer. So he was not at all in the wine. <laughs> and uh, maybe it is what helped me to, 
uh, to have an advantage on him <laughs> in terms of winemaking that I don't have with my dad. So yeah. actually, I can, uh, <laughs> I can really uh, maybe take the decision. He give me his ID, but I am the one who has the final word on Domaine de Lorient, which is the estate I created with him. So that's a bit how we handle our life. Laure, I, you completely inspire me. I, I think you're younger than me, but way more advanced. Uh, so I, I will have to do a, a consultation with you in the future. <laughs> but now let's, thank you, Laure. So now let's move to Alessia, um, who I, I received the incredible bottle uh, that her beautiful wine is in, and I will be drinking it tonight. Uh, but what's really exciting about Alessia is that she actually studied to be a sommelier and she worked as a sommelier and she studied economics. Uh, so I'd love to hear about what it was like, Alessia, to uh, serve other wines from Italy, from around the world, uh, even if your own family makes wine. And the other thing that I find very inspiring and that I wanted to learn from Alessia is that she says that since she was a little girl, she wanted to be in the family winery. And um, I was more like Laure, I, I wanted to do something else. Uh, but I want my children to be like Alessia, to want to work with me. So what is the secret, Alessia? And we, you have to unmute yourself, Alessia. So thank you, Laura, for uh, your presentation and your introduction. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being connected tonight. And uh, yes, yeah, so my, my personal uh, career and uh, about the studies was mainly during the university. I studied economics, so it was mainly focused on uh, the economic side on, uh, for the business. But actually, in the meantime, I have studied uh, to become a sommelier. And that was very important because this decision became mainly for like a personal curiosity or just a personal, um, personal knowledge. But this I realized later that was very, very important for, for like as an, an experience because uh, actually during this time of university, I had the chance to work uh, uh, in a restaurant. I did many experiences before uh, starting to work every day in the winery like I'm doing right now. Uh, I had the chance, for example, to work uh, in a, as a sommelier for a restaurant or just for uh, just as a sommelier during the, the tastings, the actual tastings. And in this, um, this situation, I had the chance to speak about and present um, other wineries' wines. Actually, it was important for me because uh, when I was talking about other wines, uh, I, in the same time, I was thinking about uh, what I usually say when I speak about my wines. And I tried to focus the attention on what are exactly the things that are interesting, of course, for all the people to hear. And, um, and what it makes uh, this wine and the winery so special and different to the other. So uh, actually the sommelier period uh, when I worked for there actually was very important for open my mind um, uh, and uh, makes me curious to try new wine. Hi, Alessia, yeah, I'm just going to interrupt you for one moment. If you could speak a little louder, um, a couple oh, of yes, yes. of us I can make people do that closer. So maybe uh, you can. Perfect, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was saying that um, this, this moment, this period was very important for me because uh, actually um, opened the mind to, uh, it makes me, makes me curious to try new wines, uh, but uh, mainly focus the attention on uh, the communication of the wine. Because uh, as I said before, the most important thing is not speaking about uh, uh, the single characteristics of the wine, but uh, all the stories behind a bottle of wine. So, uh, for example, what makes this wine special, the wineries, the connection and the link to the territory. Um, so this was my experience outside the winery. I'm so young, so this was the only. And um, for the second lounge, uh, actually, uh, if I have to tell you the truth, uh, when I was very, very young, my dream job was uh, uh, to be a truck driver. Uh, oh. driver. Uh, yes, it's, I know it's so strange, but uh, the reason is, <laughs> I know, the reason is because um, I live exactly in the front of the winery. So every day I, I used to see uh, tr um, transporter drivers or suppliers driver. And when I was very young, I used to, to speak with them. So probably this was the region of my, my dream job, but I know that is something that was impossible. And uh, besides these things, uh, I have to say that uh, for me it was, um, was very normal to stay close to my parents uh, uh, because they, they, were, they were very 
uh, great and able to introduce me, but on, not, not uh, only me, but also my sister in everyday situation and everyday things of the business of the company. So um, actually at the beginning it was like a game. Actually, when I was young, it was, everything was like a game. So um, that's why they little by little transfer to me and my sister the passion for this wine and um, for this beautiful work. So when I finished the university and when I finished my experience, I decided to enter um, and working every day in the winery. And um, if I want, I want to tell you some little things about my uh, little experience uh, in the winery because uh, I remember when I was young and I used to follow my mom during the, the tour of the winery with, uh, with the, the visitors. And I used to say behind the, of the group, and I used to pour my finger inside the barriques to taste the wines, but unfortunately they always uh, uh, find me because of the traces on the leaves. So um, other things is that, uh, for example, um, I know that um, it's, it's, it's interesting, but when I was young, like six, seven years ago, during the winter time, I used to spend my Sunday, my family Sundays in the vineyards uh, during the pruning session when my my father used to speak about how to prune and uh, um, all the secrets about the, the vines. So, um, as I said before, everything became little by little natural and uh, by passion. I were not obliged to work. Well, thank you, Alessia. It, it seems like your parents have done an extraordinary job in inspiring you. I, 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 am, I am taking notes. Um, so uh, now let's move to Anne Trimbach. Um, with, you know, this is literally one of my favorite wines in the world. Uh, and um, she is the 14th generation. I, I can't imagine, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the, 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 the fourth, and that seems extraordinary. And 14, 14, right? Is it 14? 13 only, 13 only. 13, oh, okay, only 13. Okay, so the 13th generation of her family making wine, you know, she has this extraordinary legacy and um, what I want to know about from Anne is, um, you know, what did the, the, the famous uh, great uncle say about her wanting to get involved in winemaking? She also has degrees in winemaking and economics, getting her, her boots on and her, her hands uh, dirty. Uh, what did, did the great uncle and, and the elder men of the family think about that? And also, um, I am a huge fan of um, Dreamback's social media. And I think it's just so authentic. Uh, it really speaks with, with the voice of a family. And I'd love to know about how Anne, um, you know, works on the social media. I, I don't know the details. How do you decide what to post? Uh, because I think it's, it's really what, one of the best uh, in the world. Uh, so Anne, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for having all of us tonight. It's a great experience. I love it. We should do that more often while we can traveling. So um, yes, 13 generations and the first woman to be really on the scene in front of people because my grandmother has been working very hard in the past, but she was not in front of people. She was helping, cooking, helping to bottle and etc. And uh, for the last 12 years, I've been traveling extensively. And yes, uh, my great uncle, when I came 12 years ago after my studies, he said, oh, really? You want to work with us? But are you sure you're a woman? And one day you <laughs> have kids. So how will you manage this? And at the end, I have a, a wonderful uh, daughter. She's four and a half. And uh, before COVID, I was uh, still able to travel the world and spread the message. So. Um, I had to prove that I was able to. And now I think they are happy, I hope at least. <laughs> um, and for social media, when I came, uh, the internet world did not exist. Nobody knew how to use uh, even an email. Uh, it was very hard for them. So I decided to build a website and slowly share because it's, uh, it, the world of wine is uh, about sharing uh, wine and knowledge and uh, how you do and how well, it's, uh, it's sharing. So I. This is the way to catch the eyes of people and to make their dream about, for me, Alsace, of course, and for them, Rhone, Italy, or wherever, you, Argentina. Uh, but it's uh, the way to, to, to catch the eyes of people quite easily, in a way. And I like to, to share moments that are important to us. Actually, in a small picture, you can share a lot. 
So can you I, tell us, Anne, about um, one of your videos? Like, what happens? Like, does Anne wake up in the morning and you go in the vineyard and you see a sheep and you say, "I should do a video." Like, give me some more details because, like, I loved some of the videos with I think your cousin or yes, I, I, they're just so spontaneous. How how does the magic happen? That's a good question. I never thought about that, but I think it just happens. It's it's yes i'm here or my sister sometimes is here or my cousin he's with a friend and they are sharing those moments and i'm not always behind the behind the the, the cell phone myself sometimes it's uh, videos that i receive i'm not always there but uh, at least uh, we we all have the same passion for sharing uh, our love for wine and our love for people actually as well sharing. okay so Anne, i have a very special favor to ask uh, because I, there is a song that I heard recently that um, I think can bring people together, and I'd like everybody to take their, to put their microphone um, on. So, um, so there is a a tradition in the Trainback family that some of you might know, and uh, I would like Anne to tell us about the tradition and to lead us into the trim back song please and i get red um it's a it's an old song that my great uncle hubert uh, invented a while ago when he was stuck in a train uh, while traveling somewhere in the u.s close to new york and that's like 40 plus years ago and um, since then since i started to work 12 years ago i've been asked to sing this song every time and when i was 15 i hated this song i, I really hated it but it, it, like it's part of us now for three generations. So for Hubert, my great uncle, we can sing this beautiful song. My bottle lies over the sea. My bottle lies over the sea. My bottle lies over the ocean. Bring back my bottle to me. Okay, one more time. Trim box, trim box. Bring back my bottle to me. Trim box, trim box to me. Cheers. Well, uh, Bethany, uh, I don't know if you would like um, for us to talk among us women, or I think we're pretty getting pretty close to the time to start the tasting. Uh, I am passing on the the, um, the introductions to you, Bethany. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you all very much, and I'll just um, take a moment. If anybody has any questions they want to ask up to this point, please feel free to chime in. Um, Otherwise, I think we'll get right into the tasting. Uh, so the first wine that we have is our Trimbach Riesling Reserve 2017. So I'm going to turn it over to Aunt Trimbach. Maybe. I'm drinking almost the same. I'm cheating. I have one vintage uh, after you, but I remember the 17 quite well as well. Um, this is our Riesling Reserve bottling, and as you may know, we produce lots of Riesling. We love this grape. It's 50% uh, uh, of our production. And uh, it has been a wine that we've been producing for, I would say, close to 50 years. And it has changed over the years. It has evolved. Uh, in 2010, we chose to use only our own grapes, because as you may know as well, we are owners of grapes. We own... Uh, uh, we are owners and negotiants as well. So we decided to use only our grapes. And since the last vintages, it's been really the Riboville Terroir and the Riboville parcels of vineyards we have in, in our village. So right in the middle of Alsace, where we have actually quite a lot of marl and limestone soils, which give this wine um, this beautiful minerality and uh, beautiful uh, freshness. There's always a lot of wind in Riboville, which also keeps this freshness, the acidity quite high. And uh, we like dry wines, as you know. And so we vinify as dry as possible. My 18 might be a little richer than your 17, because 17 is, um, we can say, a more classic vintage in a way, but there are no more classics uh, nowadays. Um, it's, it's a very classic style of Riesling from Alsace, as we think it should be 
drive, beautiful minerality, uh, and yes, a great, uh, a great way to start an evening with uh, some oysters or something fresh. Yeah. Ribovile, Ribovile, really, Ribovile identity. Do you have any uh, special story or memory you can share about this wine in particular? Um, Memories, I don't know, but yes, actually, yes. Uh, sometimes I'm very surprised when I travel, and probably my best memory with this wine was um, a, a customer that loves our wine. He comes to a tasting and he brought a bottle, it was more, maybe four years ago, of Riesling 1990 Reserve that I tried very, very rarely. I maybe tried it two times before in my life, and I was a bit afraid, like, oh, la, la, it's just a reserve, it's not Frédéric Emile or Clos Saint-Uil, which are our great. Uh, signatures and treasure bottlings, it's reserve. Will it be okay? And it was just amazing. Plus the vintage 1990, but yes, that's a good memory of a Riesling reserve to me. And thank you for bringing this wine again. <laughs> Wonderful. And we have a question from Wilfred um, in reference to the adjective minerality. So many wine tasters use the word minerality to discuss um, this particular uh, element in a wine, how do you describe it? Um, I had a hard time to understand it and it took me some years to really understand it and I think the more I tasted and the more I felt it, I could, um, I could, yes, understand it myself, but it's more a sensation than anything else. It's uh, nothing really on the nose, it's more like sensation of, it's, it's always very difficult to explain, mm. um, but sensation, my, my father said to me one day, go in the vineyard and take a stone, a, a limestone stone, and you will see what it means. And he, I, I, I loved because I thought it was really, it was stupid, but at, at, at the end it helped me a lot, I think. But it's a really this sensation of, oh, how can you explain? Help me the others, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to say, but sensation for sure. Nothing about me, the aromatics or the taste itself. But that, that's personal. I don't know. Yeah. What about you? Yeah. Anybody? Anybody have anything else to add about minerality? I know it's a uh, it can be a controversial topic in our world. Ah, licking the stones. Yeah. So we, we all seem to be learning about minerality by licking the stones. So thank you for that explanation. Great. Um, so uh, a question from Deborah. Um, she's asking as you're out about in the U.S. and also the rest of the, your world markets, do consumers immediately know that this is a dry wine? Uh, we had a misperception in some parts of our country that Riesling equals sweet. So do you run into that and how do you get around that? I run around that uh, all the time, always. Um, I still hear many people telling me, oh la la, Riesling is going to be too sweet for my taste. I don't like Riesling. Uh, Riesling, uh, it's difficult from Alsace, you never know what, what you get. And it's still a kind of reality, even though these things from Alsace are getting, they have, they are dry, most of them. The big names that you all know are dry today and you, you can rely on, on the dryness of the wines today. But it's true that in the past, it, it has, a, in a way, ruined the image of uh, the Alsace because you never knew what you would buy. And even me today, I have difficulties. If I don't know the producer, I'm not quite sure I will buy Pinot Gris for sure not gives even even more, even less. And that's a reality and it's, it's very sad. So yes, um, now it's better, but it's still uh, the image to build back again. And what I say to people, usually I force them to try my everything. Like, no, oh, please trust me, try the risk, you love it. And they usually are very impressed. Like, they love it, I love it. So yes. No, it's not on the label, unfortunately. It's on the back label. They, uh, it said it's a dry Riesling, but uh, not on the front. It's not uh, just like that, that you, you know, if you don't know trim back. Um, and one last question before we move on to the second wine. Um, and this, this is always a big one, uh, climate change. How are you seeing that? And if you can answer very briefly. Yes, very briefly. <laughs> very so to briefly. today, I mean, the shirts are very warm still now. My windows are open. It's uh, 7.30 in the evening. Fifteen years ago, I was wearing a double jacket and everybody was freezing outside waiting for the grapes to arrive and go home in the warm. So yes, it's, uh, it's very, very different. We harvest earlier, the degrees are very high. It's, uh, it's, 
yes, it's affecting a lot and it's uh, no more classic vintage like we used to have. And from the 90s to today, no more need to fertilize anything. But in the old days, in the 80s, when my granddad was uh, still in charge with my father, every year we needed to fertilize almost every wine except Vendange Tardive, Late Harvest, and so on. Thank you for sharing that. I have to say that this is um, one of my all-time favorite wines, and I always have a healthy supply on hand at home, so thank you for producing such a beautiful wine. Um, with that, we're going to move on to wine number two, um, and I'm going to turn it over to Laura Colombo. This is the Jean-Luc Colombo La Belle de Vie Saint-Jean 2018. Bonjour, Bethany. Again. Um, so we are tasting uh, the Saint Perret. It's a it's a small appellation just next to Cornas. So maybe most of the people were thinking, uh, oh, with Colombo we will try Cornas tonight. But of course, this would have been the case if you were with my dad. But you're with me, so <laughs> so I'm trying uh, what my dad has been doing for 30 years with Cornas to try to place Cornas on the big table around the world. I'm trying to do the same with saint Perret, which is a very unknown AOC in the Northern Rhone, but that is an incredible uh, small AOC uh, with a lot of diversity, a lot of biodiversity, a lot of nature, small plots of vineyards a bit everywhere in the middle of the forest. So a, a place you definitely all need to visit, come. like everywhere maybe in the world, but this is my home, so... <laughs> Um, it is a, this is a, a single vineyard wine uh, in a, one of the oldest parts of the AOC because uh, Saint Perret has been uh, renowned in the 19th century uh, and especially for its bubbles. It was a, a, an AOC with a lot of uh, bubbles, but it completely collapsed because uh, uh, it was not fashion anymore to make bubbles. It was maybe a bit too heavy. So it went from 1,000 hectares, the AOC, to almost 10 hectares. And these are part of the very, very few old vines that remain always planted in, uh, in saint Perret. So it's old vine, co-planted, a bit like uh, sometime in Alsace, uh, Roussan and Marsan, that we harvest all together and uh, vinify together. So two-thirds, basically, of Roussan and one third of Marsan. We never really know because like I told you, it is co-planted. Uh, the name of La Belle de Mai is the name of the area in saint Perret, but also it's moreover uh, a tribute to my grandmother because like I said, my parents were not at all in, in the wine. Uh, my dad, uh, uh, my, my grandmother actually was a chef in Marseille. She had a restaurant in a place called uh, La Belle de Mai, which is an area in Marseille. Uh, my dad wanted to, um, to take over, but uh, for my grandmother, there were no way. Uh, she said, no, 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 uh, you, you won't become a, a chef. You need to be a doctor because uh, 30 years ago, uh, to be a chef was not as fancy as today. But uh, so he failed in medicine. He finished as a pharmacist. And in pharmacy, there is just one way to, to become an ologist. So when, of course, when he created this one that was uh, on Chemin du Mois de Mai, he called it uh, after, the, after the name of the restaurant of my grandmother. Uh, voilà. It's a 2018 vintage with exactly like Anne said, it's not a very traditional vintage, but we don't have very traditional vintage anymore. It is quite uh, a bit richer. The good thing is because it's old vine, uh, we really see the difference today because we got really, really hot summer now. And only the old vines can really manage to, um, to get rid of this high temperature and to, and to keep freshness and minerality. Okay. Getting a lot of comments from the group here that the aromatic complexity is, is stunning on this wine. It's, it's, it's really a beautiful, beautiful wine. And the texture, very rich and complex. Um, we're curious, so many of us are familiar with Cornas and the terrain and, and the extreme terrain of Cornas. 
how does Sampere um, compare to Kornos in terms of its uh, landscape architecture? And also, um, where is it situated compared to Kornos? So basically, Sampere is called Sampere. That's the name of the AOC, of course, but it could be found right because the AOC are really, it's two villages that touch each other. It is the southern part of the northern Rhone. So we are uh, at the, um, what we say in France, we are really at the border of the Mediterranean climate. In fact, we have a mix. If you go just 30 kilometers south of saint pierre or cornas you are in Provence. If you go 30 kilometers north, you are in uh, Lyon with the continental vegetation. So here in saint pierre and cornas we have the same climate with uh, both like rosemary and juniper like Provence, but also like uh, oak tree, uh, like, uh, like in the continental place. So you, you get this specificity. And what makes, I think, Cornas and Sapere very special among the other AOC in the Northern Rhone uh, is that it's really wild. You really, you don't have vines everywhere. If you visit us one day and uh, if you go to my parents' house or my house, uh, I live in, on top of the hill in saint Pere, and uh, my neighbor is a goat cheese grower, so he has goats. Uh, my other neighbor has bees. Uh, I have cows. Uh, we grow uh, apple also. So it's not just vines, it's really polyculture. And for us, it's very important to have this diversity around the vineyards. And that's, I think, really the specificity of... of uh, Cornas and saint Pere together. Um, and so there's a question that came in from Clive. Um, these two great varieties, Marsan and Roussan, um, produce very stylistically different wines. Um, can you talk a little bit about the range of styles that you can mm -hmm. make from these two varieties? Well, it's interesting because we just finished harvest today, and uh, especially on the vintage like this, which is very hot, you, if you go in the vineyard and harvest with us, you will definitely understand why people use more Marsan than Roussan in all the blend we will eat. Because Marsan is good grape, is good bay, a lot of juice, that doesn't suffer from disease, doesn't suffer from heat. It's uh, the perfect grapes in terms of volume. We use more Roussan <laughs> because we think Roussan is a bit more, in fact, what we said, Marsan is for to make uh, the wine, <laughs> to make the volume of the wine, to make the juice. And Roussan is for the aroma. It's more delicate, it's, it's very small, small bay. Like her name, Roussan, it means that it's a bit red when, it's, uh, when it is uh, ripe. So you get uh, more tannin, that is important to the wine actually. Uh, and moreover, which is very important for us today because we are in the south of France a bit, uh, so a lot of heat also, uh, sometimes not a lot of acidity. So we play a lot with bitterness today. And uh, I know that sometimes bitterness can be a bad word for people in the wine uh, industry. But I think for us, it is really part of the balance of the wine. And the Roussan brings this bitterness, which will balance with the alcohol and make a balanced wine. I think that's, uh, for me, that's my key today to, to work with this. Thank you. And um, just to wrap up, I know that um, cooking is very, very central to your family's DNA. You're uh, the ultimate entertainers and, and a meal at the Colombo home is something of an experience that you'll never forget. So when you're drinking this wine at home, what is your favorite food pairing? Uh, so if it's uh, at home, uh, I think there is a, a very, um, it's not really basic, but it's really what we like to pair. It's coming, like uh, I, I said previously, from our godfather, Paul Bocuse. It's une poularde en demi-day, so it's, uh, it's basically a big chicken that we stuff with truffle under the skin, and we cook it in, um, uh, in um, I don't think it's, well, in, in the oven like this, and uh, it, it, uh, it gives a lot of flavor, and uh, well, it's, it's the best uh, pairing for me with cream. Right. Sounds fantastic. 
Laura, thank you very much for sharing this slide. Okay. Um, so I think we'll move on to our first line now, which is um, traveling, and I'd like to invite Alexia to join us to talk a little bit more about this line. Yes. Okay. Can you hear well about, uh, now? Um, Can you hear me? I'm just a little bit closer, I think. Okay. Like this? Perfect. Okay. So, um, yes, today I'm presenting the Gafna 2016. I have to tell you that uh, we are, uh, I think, at the end uh, of the number of bottles that uh, are available because uh, we are moving to 2017 very soon. In a couple of weeks, we're going to 2017. And Sorry, so Alexia, we're having a bit of trouble hearing you. Okay, is better now? Yes, yeah, good. Okay, good. Okay, I try to speak a little louder. Uh, so I was saying that uh, probably this will be one of the last bottles that uh, you can find on the market because uh, uh, we are going to present the new vintage that will be 2017 and um, it will be released on the market I think in a couple of weeks maximum. And so today uh, I can say that this wine has uh, um, about uh, one year of um, bottle refining, bottle aging. So I think it's it's a very nice moment to drink to drink this wine, even if it feels very fresh, it's very young. If you think about that it's a 2016, probably you can, the first thing that you can feel is the freshness. But uh, beside this, um, I want to tell you something uh, more about this specific wine, because this one is uh, uh, one of the historical label of the family. And um, because at the beginning, my great grandfather used to make uh, uh, this Gattinara and the Reserva. So this wine was the wine to drink daily and the Reserva was the special selection, obtained with the special selection of the best area and, uh, and so was the wine to leave in the cellar and uh, for maybe the special occasion. So um, this is why I say this one of the historical labels, but also is the, the flagship wines because uh, it's called simply Gattinara as the name of the appellation where we are, the DOCG appellation. And um, it's one of the best expression and interpretation of the- uh, Yeah, I think I got it sent to me yeah. by you. Yeah. Okay. Um, this because uh, Gattinara Appellation extends on uh, four different hills. Um, and um, Travaglini, the um, company has the, the vineyards in all four different hills. This is important because uh, actually each single hills has a um, particular difference in terms of uh, um, in, terms, in terms of rocks, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the composition of the soil, in terms of uh, altitude and uh, the exposure to the sun. Also, the single you know, vineyards that we have on uh, each single uh, hill has different age. So um, this Gattinara actually is, uh, is obtained by blending together all the vineyards of the property, of course, except the selection for the Reserva and for all the other wines that we produce. But all the rest is blended together for making the classic Gattinara right after um, the end of the fall of the, the aging process. It's because during the harvest, uh, we maintain separ separately, of course, each single vineyard, and then we blend together after uh, almost uh, two years and a half. Actually, this is because uh, this wine, of course, is aged for three years in total. Um, actually, the, uh, it, it, it uh, ferments in the stainless steel tanks uh, um, following the traditional red wine fermentation, and then stays in the stainless steel tanks for about three months. Then uh, is moved to the cellar right after the, sorry, the, in, in January, usually. We move this wine in, uh, in the barrels, in the big Slovenian oaks barrels, and it remains for about uh, uh, 30 months. 25 to 30 months. Uh, and then of course it's bottled and uh, some months uh, refining in the bottle. Um, as I said before, it's one of the, the best interpretation of Gattinara. This is because we, we have all the vineyards in, uh, in all the, the area of this beautiful appellation. Fantastic. And I know the question comes up quite frequently when I'm working with Gattinara out in the marketplace, but um, a lot of folks are familiar with Barolo and Barbaresco and ask how Gattinara compares um, to those two uh, arguably larger names, at, at least in the U.S. market. How would you describe it? 
Of course, uh, the, the South Piedmont, so Lange, Barol and Barbaresco is a very important area. And, uh, but actually, Gattiara, it's a, a really small one, but it's uh, the biggest in the North Piedmont. Actually, Gattinara is located in the really North Piedmont to um, Rosa Mountain foothills. We are, just for let you understand where we are exactly, between exactly between Milan and Turin, and uh, around one hour and a half from, from uh, Alba, in the middle of the Lange. So um, we are actually pretty close, but um, there, the, the two appellations are completely different because uh, the two mainly different are the the soil, the composition of the soil, and the microclimate, and this is what makes the differences between a Barolo and a Gattinara. Uh, this because, for example, talking about the, the soil, actually um, our soil is mainly based on rocks. Uh, rocks like porphyry, um, iron and granite are the main big ones. And um, when I say we have a very important composition, it's because uh, uh, sometimes happen that walking between the rows of the vineyards, uh, you can walk directly on the rocks. And uh, this what uh, when we speak about the minerality, Actually, uh, we speak about something that comes from directly from the soil because the roots go deeply uh, between the rocks. And uh, the second thing that uh, differs from uh, the South Piedmont is the microclimate because we are very close to the Rosa Mountain and uh, it is very important for its influence on our ter territory. Just because uh, all the Rosa Mountain chain makes a sort of, uh, of wall that protects uh, Gattinara from, uh, for example, uh, the wind from uh, um, Atlantic Ocean or the North Europe. So that's why during the winter we have a higher temperature than the south. And during the summer it's uh, completely the opposite. We have less humidity, uh, the temperature are like, are a little below um, or a little lower. And then we have the influence of the, of the lake that makes an important excursion permit from night and day. This is very important for the, for the elegance, the final elegance of the wine. Um, Alessia, we have a, a question concerning uh, aging potential for Gattinara. So, vintage variation aside, in general, what would you recommend as the ideal or optimum aging capacity for Gattinara in general? And what is your preference in terms of when you'd like to drink it? Actually, um, the age potential of this wine is uh, in, it's, it's pretty it's pretty long because. Uh, um, because, for example, we had the chance to taste uh, um, more bottles from 1967, 1964, 1970, and uh, actually we realized that this wine were imp uh, impressively still alive. Actually, uh, you have always to think about what is a Nebbiolo, so the Nebbiolo basically has a very important life and um, a very important structure. And also, if you think that what makes a wine uh, potentially uh, good for um, a great age are the, um, the tannins, the acidity, and it also uh, could help the minerality because uh, the complexity of this wine comes uh, basically from the rocks. If you analyze this wine, it's, uh, uh, it's more um, complex than a wine from the south because of the difference of the soil. But actually, when you when you taste it, when you drink it, you you cannot feel this complexity because it's very, um, you can say it's very very delicate on the palate. So of course, uh, um, if you want to feel to, to smell these uh, beautiful floral perfumes uh, and this, this freshness, this fruity on the palate, I suggest you to drink this wine in in ten years. But if you like the aged wines, uh, if you like to to taste. A completely different uh, portfolio of perfumes. Um, I can suggest you to drink uh, in more than 20 years. Excellent. Thank you. And one last question: um, the shape of this bottle. Uh, Laura was talking about it earlier in our session, but can you just give us a little bit of history as to how this came about? Yes. Um, first of all, I would like to say that we have uh, seven different products on our portfolio. And we use this special bottle only for the three Gattinara and then it's Sonia because the wine dedicated to my grandfather. Um, this because um, in uh, actually in 1958 that was uh, also the, the first vintage where my grandfather produced this wine. Uh, he designed 
personally this special bottle uh, because at the time uh, before his, he inherited the, the, uh, the winery sorry actually um, the wine and the techniques for making the wine were not the same of course that we have now especially in Gattinara I'm talking about Gattinara and so it was easy to find uh, uh, to find some sediments in the bottle after, only after maybe a couple of years and my father was obsessed by the sediment uh, um, on the glass so that's why he designed this particular bottle with uh, this belly on the front and when uh, when uh, uh, he poured the wine in that way actually the sediment can stay in the belly of the bottle so um, this is important because, uh, of course, it's, it's patented. Down here, there is the number of the patent. And uh, it always remains the bottle, uh, the, the symbol of the, the Travaglini. Because um, actually, uh, there is a story behind this. Because uh, um, in 1980, uh, a journalist described this bottle uh, as bad looking and horrible. And so my grandfather decided to bottle the 1982 Reserva half quantity in this bottle and uh, the other half in the Bordeaux bottle shape. But uh, at the end of the year, he realized that um, the Bordeaux bottles remain unsold because people do not recognize the Gattinara from, uh, from Travaglini. So he decided to continue and to use his, pro his, uh, his project, his idea, and now became the symbol, of course, of uh, our Gattinara. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alessia. Appreciate it. And We'll move on to our last wine of the day today. It's the Bodegas Caro. So, Laura, I would like to invite you to join us once again to talk a little bit more about this beautiful wine. Uh, thank you, Bethany. There's a, a, a really good question from Pat Thompson about uh, women in families going into, you know, the office or the vineyard. We're going to answer that later, right? Yes. Okay. Because I, I think that's a really good, important question. Yeah. That so was good. They, yeah. So, Bodegas Caro. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know if you see it, but here's the label. Yeah, see it. Um, and I actually have in my background the cellar, which was built in 1884. Um, Bodegascaro, um, you know, our partnership bought this part of, of a very old building. And so it's, it's kind of a beautiful thing, uh, you know, because we're partners with the Rasha family and, and such an old winemaking tradition. And we live in this ancient building. And um, it feels like we've been making the wine for a hundred years, but the first vintage was the 2000. So I told you a little bit about the story of how we met um, and how the project started and was named. Uh, but really the, the basis of this wine was bringing back to life this Malbec Cabernet Sauvignon blend, which had basically been lost by the world because uh, this, which was the most important blend, uh, you know, Malbec was much more important than Merlot in the 18th and 19th century in Bordeaux, um, you know, in 1855, when the Grand Cus were classified, there was a lot more Malbec planted. In fact, the Encyclopedia Britannica says that there was even more Malbec than Cabernet Sauvignon in the Médoc. Uh, this is the Encyclopedia Britannica from uh, 1889. If, you, if any of you want all this data, I, I have spent the last 10 years of my life doing historical research on Malbec. Um, but, uh, but anyhow, so this beautiful blend of Malbec Cabernet Sauvignon, which was on its way to being extinct, um, we were able to bring back. And what's exciting about this project is that, you know, it's a partnership with the, the Lafitte uh, Rochid family, uh, who are arguably the, the world experts on Cabernet Sauvignon, and our family, um, which is uh, known for pioneering and resuscitating uh, Malbec. So here comes this beautiful wine. And I loved... Um, what Laure said about bitterness, because I think that in, in winemaking and wine blending and when you're making decisions, uh, it's really important to be aware of the bitterness because people don't want things to be too sweet and too soft. Uh, you need a little bit of bitterness so that you can soften it. And then that combination of a little bit of bitterness with the softness, it's what's so magical about wine. Why wine to me tastes so much better than, than beer or spirits or any other alcoholic drink or, or basically any other drink at all. <laughs> but uh, so the Malbec, it softens the Cabernet Sauvignon, which is a little more bitter. And I, that is why the Malbec was always uh, blended. And in fact, in some of these old French texts, 
the, the writers say you must always blend Malbec with Cabernet Sauvignon because it's the bitterness and the softness. And when they come together, you get this beautiful, rich wine that also has, you know, a structure and, 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 and una espina, like a, a, a central cord. Um, but in terms of uh, this particular vintage, it's, it's interesting because 17 was a small vintage. It was cold for a couple of days. We had a frost and that's why it was small, but in general, it was warm. And it was one of these vintages where the Malbec was um, remarkably better in Altamira, where the vineyard is for Bodegas Caro, than the Cabernet Sauvignon. So generally this blend is half and half, but for this vintage, it's 74% Malbec and 26% Cabernet Sauvignon. But for me on the palate, it's a 50-50, but it has a lot more uh, Malbec. Uh, we use the barrels that are made at uh, Domaine Baron de Rochille. So they're sent from France. They're, they're made by the, 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 the um, Rochille family. And uh, the wine has about 80% New Oak. Um, but Anyhow, for me, it's a very special wine because it brings back history and, it, and it's the new history of Argentina, of our two families. And the one other comment I would make uh, is that my husband really, really loves this wine. And so we often drink it uh, when we go out to dinner and it ages really, really beautifully. If you are able to get a, a hold of, uh, you know, the 2002 vintage, the 2006, the 2010, they, they are really stunning. So thank you. Salud. Thank you so much. Um, there was a comment that there's a beautiful angularity to this wine that invites food pairing too. So I, I completely agree and um, wow, what a fantastic message. Thank you so much. Um, so I think what uh, I, I would like to do is um, get back to Pat's question. The question was on the topic of women and wine in general. So a decade ago, a female winemaker in Montalcino told Pat Tompkins that 30% of her enology class was female, but almost none of them got hands-on winemaking jobs. Most of them ended up in the front office. What would you say is the case now from your direct experience or anecdotally in the industry? Uh, Laura, do you want to start? So yeah, I, I can start. So when, when I started, uh, you know, working with my father that I was still doing medicine and wine in 1995, yeah. um, you know, there weren't 30% female, I mean, women studying enology. In Argentina, I would say it was less, but it, it changed very quickly to today. It's probably 40% uh, are women. Uh, but uh, really, all the top positions were men. There were some women in winemaking. There were no women in viticulture. And many of the women would go study winemaking and then go to the business side. But even more horrifying to me when I started was that, um, you know, the women were running the show, but they had a male boss that like was just the boss. Uh, so, you know, I, I became very passionate when I started about uh, the fact that we had these extraordinary women, um, you know, there had to be equal pay. That was the first thing. You know, if you have a certain job, you should get paid the same as a man. And, you know, I, I'm ashamed to say that I found a few situations where, you know, people were doing the same thing and the woman was getting paid less. And so that's something that I um, work, you know, a lot with a human resources person so that, that, that there's equal parity. And, uh, and in terms of positions, the same thing, you know, our, our head uh, of viticulture for, you know, the most famous vineyard that we have for Catena is a woman, uh, but she's quite young because, you know, and she was, I think, one out of three women in her class. Now there's more women. The head of viticulture for Bolegascaro is a woman. Uh, she is incredible uh, and she's a soil specialist and she's, I think, 26 years old, but she's really, you know, just incredible. She's worked in France. I mean, she knows so much. And the first winemaker for Bolegascaro was Estela Berinetti, who really, for a long time was, was other than Susana Balbo, the only other well-known women winemaker. Um, so I think that uh, the comment from Pat, you could say it about the world. And in terms of my opinion about we women, you know, of power, you know, all the other uh, winemakers presenting here from around the world is that we can't just wait for things to happen. You know, we need to go there and have the difficult conversations with the uncles and the cousins and, 
you know, men and women and, and make things happen. And actually when men see how well the organization works when there's, you know, just as high an amount of women and men in power, they become the biggest fans, which I think was what Anne was saying of her great uncle that like, he's the biggest fan of, of her because he sees how incredible she is. Um, so anyhow, I'm, I'm very positive about the future, uh, but I think that the past is, is a little scary. Thank you. Does anybody have anything they'd like to add to Lara's answer? I can only say that um, it's particularly interesting to hear about your story because, of course, you are um, older than me. And uh, when I was younger, uh, it was already a word that uh, was was, um, was almost in a very, I, I cannot say totally uh, equal gender um, balance, but actually uh, was uh, was um, in a very beautiful situation. I think uh, it's better than what was in the past. So to me, I cannot see, in my opinion, I cannot see the uh, very important differences in, uh, in, in the simple jobs and the simple words. For what concerns Travaglini, for example, I always speak about my grandfather, but I have to tell you that uh, my grandfather could reach the results that uh, he reached uh, thanks to, um, to my grandmother, because uh, they share completely the activity. And my grandfather was the, the, the front man was the man who decided, but uh, also the person who had to manage the offices. But everything that was uh, from bottling uh, to working in vineyards, uh, uh, almost all the, the season um, of the years was my grandmother. And uh, today, uh, actually, the, I can say 30% of the total staff uh, is of women, is made of women. And also my personal family, um, we are three female and only the only male is my is my father. Actually, uh, to my personal opinion is that we uh, we are moving in a very good direction, and uh, I agree with you, Laura, that uh, the past could be um, could be something dark, and to, and from today uh, and the future would be would be better. Great. Um, and and Clive had a question concerning you know I think you touched on where you're finding support as a woman in this industry, but where do you continue to see the biggest challenges as a woman in the wine industry? Uh, I cannot hear you. Uh, it was directly to me. To anybody on the panel, uh, you, if you have a thought on it or we can throw it out to the group. Um, but the biggest challenges today as a woman in the wine industry, what would you say that is your biggest challenge today? Uh, of, of course, it, um, I, I go forward to the, the something that I was speaking about. So today, uh, actually, could be sometimes could be strange, but uh, to, to me, to my personal experience, and to my opinion, nowadays is uh, it's even more frequently to find a woman in wine. I know not only in, in Italy, but also the world that from uh, um, one generation to the other, and the new one actually sometimes happens that a woman can have control of the winery and could be the front woman of the winery. So um, you have always to, um, to be uh, strong to do all kind of words, of course, but actually it would be uh, uh, it's about the total uh, equality of the gender. Great, thank you. Uh, Laura, as a veteran on our panel here, what would you say remain the biggest challenges for you as a woman in the industry? Well, um, you know, I also read another comment that said, when will this be a thing talking about women? Uh, yeah. I have to say that when I started, I was actually always kind of annoyed when I'd be asked to join a women's symposium because I thought, you know, I'm on equal standing. And I came from medicine where, you know, I, I really just worked with men, uh, you know, in, on equal standing from the beginning because there, there's more women doctors than there were women winemakers. But I think that, you know, more recently, um, there has been a consciousness that uh, there's just still so much work to be done. And uh, that actually, I find that men are particularly interested, uh, just as interested in it as women, because they see that when they work in mixed groups, you know, more things get done. It's more fun. It's, it's more interesting. So, um, you know, I, uh, I am now 
very excited to join in this conversation. I think it has as much to do with men as with women. And I say something very controversial that my daughter said that, like, I should be put in jail for saying this. Um, so please, I don't know if you're the, the journalist, if you think it's awful, don't write it. But uh, I say that actually there's something that to me, there's not male equality either. Because, you know, there's still, you know, for example, if I've heard this at my own winery, you know, you ask, uh, a man says, I have to go home because my kid's sick. And their boss, who's a man, says, well, where's your wife? You know, that still happens. Men are not allowed to take on, you know, if a man says, I have to go home early because I have to make dinner, people think it's strange. If a woman says it, everybody understands. So to me, there's so there's such a long road for both men and women. And I think that this new conversation we're having today is, is more interesting. It, it's, it's not from a place of anger, it's from a place of progress and what we all want. And, uh, and I'm very excited about the future. And, and, but I think that in order for this conversation to happen, there have to actually be more numbers of women in power positions. And that's what we're seeing today on this conversation today, you know, among the journalists, and among uh, these women from these very historic families that have uh, important roles. Yeah. Thank you so much. So um, keeping an eye on time here, and we don't want to take up too much of your days, but I just want, now wanted to open the floor if anybody has any additional questions for our panelists or would just like to, to chat with some of your, your friends here on, online. We'd love to open the floor to do that. Um, and either I've had a couple questions um, or actually comments remarking on the fact that um, women as consumers often get a slightly cold shoulder too in wine shops and restaurants. Um, if anybody would like to share an experience they had as a consumer, uh, we would love to hear about that as well. Okay. Um, great. Well, I think. We have a couple comments. Don't get me started. We could be here all day if we open that door. So um, I just wanted to thank all of our panelists and our moderator very much for the time today, but more so all of you for joining us and spending part of your day with us. Um, it's been, as I said, fantastic to see all of you and, and have everyone together. And really can't wait till we can do this again uh, online and, and more so in person. So thank you very much. And we are happy to answer any questions that come up after the fact. Just reach out to me and we will direct the questions appropriately. Uh, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world. And um, if I could just ask our panelists to stay on for an extra minute, we're going to take a photo of the four of you together. So thank you very much and uh, see you all soon. Uh, cheers. Salud. Valeu.